So uh, the problem, uh, the problem uh, with uh, creativity is everybody's doing it wrong because everybody's trying too hard. And when you try too hard, you're not being creative. You just you're just actually being messy and you forget what the job is and you forget what you're doing. Now in our job, in my job, it's advertising. And the problem in my job is uh, 18.3 billion pounds is spent every year in the UK on advertising. Of that, 4% is remembered positively. 7% is remembered negatively, 89% isn't noticed or remembered. Roughly 9 out of 10 ads aren't even noticed. Uh, that's around well, about £17 billion pounds pissed away by people who think they know what they're doing. So if you think that's harsh, just to give you an idea of forgetting the fact that we're all sophisticated designers, sophisticated art directors, sophisticated copywriters, marketing people, brand strategists, all the rest of it. We're not supposed to be any of that, we're supposed to be people. And we're talking to people. We're not talking to brand strategists and copywriters and designers. So, from a people point of view, they reckon the numbers are, if you live in a major conurbation, a big city, you see you're exposed to over a thousand advertising messages a day. Between posters, press ads, TV, uh, pre-rolls on your laptop, uh, pop-up messages, uh, all the different ads you see everywhere, you can't move for it, a thousand a day. Now, as a consumer, forget what you're working on, but just as a consumer, be a consumer, be an ordinary person for a minute. Hold your hand up if you remember one from yesterday. Nobody? One? No? You must remember one from yesterday. One ad that you saw as a consumer yesterday, when you were walking around the streets, when you were flipping through the papers, when you were watching TV, when you were looking at your laptop. One. Anybody else? One? Okay, what we got here about, what, two? Okay, what we got here, we got about 120 people. You each saw a thousand ads today, that's 120,000 ads, and you remember two. That's the actual job we're doing, or we're not doing. Two out of 120,000 is what gets seen. All you think you're doing, all everybody thinks they're doing, is ads for other advertising people. But when you're actually in the real world of taxi drivers, shop assistants, lorry drivers, nobody's looking. It's all, it's all just visual pollution, yeah? Yeah, thank you. And, and so nobody's doing their job. Everybody's just advertising for each other. So they can get their little ads seen in the trade press or uh, seen on uh, YouTube or maybe into them for cans or whatever thing it is they do. But that's nothing to do with people, which is what we're supposed to be doing if we're in advertising. Remember that two out of 120,000 here. That's the scale of what actually... So the job is about simplicity, not complexity. We all make the job too complicated. We all read more books, more articles, learn more long words, learn more jargon, impress each other in meetings with how many new thoughts we've got on new styles and new ways of doing things. And we think that's the job. And the more complicated we get, the further we move away from real people, from what our job actually is. Um, stupid people think complicated is clever. Smart people know simple is clever. 
you have to go, but simple is more difficult than complicated. Because you have to go beyond complicated to get to simple. Stupid people stop at complicated. Because it sounds clever. Long words, jargon, sounds clever. But you've got to go beyond that to get to simple. And when you come to simple, you can't hide anymore. If what you're saying is stupid, it's obvious. So when people are only saying stupid things, they hide it with long words. So what I've learned, when you read a brief, if it's full of long words, it's probably rubbish. The more complicated, the quality of the brief is inversely proportional to the length of the jargon. If you read a brief with short words, it's probably pretty good. If you read a brief with long words, it's usually rubbish. The long words are there to cover up the fact that the guy couldn't be bothered to do any thinking. Let me give you a for instance of where people get confused and think more information is better and clutter it up with more and more information. Uh, this is an old, an old piece of film from an old Bob Hope movie 50 years ago. Um, it's only a, a for instance. Bob Hope is a cowboy and he's about to go to a gunfight and everybody thinks they're really helpful giving him information. And just see what happens. Can you play it please? Put the volume up as loud as you can. So lean to the right, there's a wind from the east, so better aim to the west. I know this Joe like a book. He crouches when he shoots, so stand on your toes. He goes to the left, so lean to the right, there's a wind from the east, better aim to the west. He crouches when he shoots, so stand on your toes. Thanks. Shoots, but her aim to the west. He draws from his toes, so lean towards the wind. Ha ha, I got it. Watch it, watch it. Okay, get the idea. Harry, he thinks the more he's got, the more information he's got, the more stuff he's learned, the better he's going to be. But actually, it's just made it more complicated and made it worse, and there's no focus. Einstein said, uh, if, he, if the world was about to end and he had an hour to save it, he'd spend 50 minutes thinking about the problem and 10 minutes thinking about the solution. Because if he got the problem right, the solution would be simple. But if he didn't get the problem right, there would be no solution. So getting, simplifying it down to what the actual problem is, the one single simple th powerful thing, is what our job is. And yet, 
because at the moment what makes it worse and what makes it more confusing is technology and everybody is so desperate to keep up with the latest technology and not to be left out and not to be left behind and everybody wants to be the one who mentions in the meeting whatever the latest tech piece of technology is or whatever the latest piece of clever thinking is that they've read or whatever the latest fashion is that they've read in an article or in a book you don't want to be left out everybody's reading this book this is the new thing everybody's talking about this is the new technology everybody's talking about it's a new award it's a new you must be so if you ask people in the creative department nowadays what do they do they will say they are uh, they do content curation or they do heuristics or they do algorithms or they do big data or they do native advertising or they do storytelling or they do mobile optimized or wearable tech or they do cross-platform or they do rich media solutions or they do memes or tropes or they do seo or crm or csr or ctr or cms or UGC, or KPI, or ROI. Now for me, the only three letters missing is WTF. <laughs> Everybody's forgotten what the job is. None of that is the job. That's all just tools. That's, that's just tools. And you decide which of those you're going to use when you've worked out what your job is. But people do that instead of doing the job. We have technicians for all of that. That's technician stuff. Or planner stuff. It's not what we do. It's not our job. <clears throat> As I said, 4% of, at its best, 4% of the media is remembered positively. 7% is remembered negatively. 89% isn't noticed or remembered. So we don't understand the media. Before we start off with what, we, what we're doing, we don't understand the media. So let's go back and... It's always best to go back, instead of getting more and more complicated, go back to basics. There's power in simplicity and weakness in complexity. So go back to basics and keep it simple. What's the media? How does it work? What's the history of the media? Okay. So... That's the consumer. We started off trying to reach the consumer with cave paintings. Right? Pictures of animals on walls. <clears throat> then that changed and we evolved and we did oil paintings and frescoes tried to reach the consumer that way then that changed and it evolved and we got photography tried to reach the consumer that way then it changed and evolved and we got film tried to reach the consumer that way then it changed and evolved again, and we got TV. Changed and evolved again, and we got digital. Tried to reach the consumer that way. Pretty soon it's going to change and evolve again, to whatever the latest thing is that somebody invents that they'll say it's the new thing and everything else is dead. So it's always changing and evolving, the ways of reaching the consumer. But can you see one thing on there that isn't changing and evolving, one thing on there that's never changed, one thing on there that will never change? That's the media. This is not the media. This is just different ways to get to the media. Because what we want, if we get to here, we can get him or her to talk to other people about it. Who talks to someone else about it? Who talks to someone else about it? Who talks to someone else about it? And we've gone viral. 
And when you go viral, you create media worth many, many times your original spend. Many, many times. That's why you go viral. You create media you're not paying for. You can pay five million to get here and end up with 20 million of free media. That's why you go viral. But where you go viral is here, not here. If an ad dies here, it just goes on TV, stops, the bus driver, the shop assistant, the cab driver, the housewife, don't pick it up, don't talk about it, then it doesn't go viral, it's dead. And your money's wasted. And you become part of that 89% that isn't seen or remembered. To be part of the 4% that is seen or remembered, that is seen and remembered positively, or even the 7% that is remembered negatively, you've got to get into there. You don't stop here. This is, where tech, this is what technicians do. This is what we should be doing. And for this, you need a good idea. You don't need the latest piece of technology, whatever the latest piece of technology is. David Abbott said, shit that arrives at the speed of light is still shit when it gets there. <laughs> Let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, I'll play you uh, 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 this video. Don't worry about the pictures, just listen to the soundtrack. This is a tune that's on every ice cream truck in the UK and has been for 50 years. Can you just play the second video? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. since you're a child. You know it from, the, from virtually the minute you're born, and it's on every ice cream truck, all around the country, every time the sun comes out. Uh, it's called Green Sleeves. Uh, you won't know who wrote it, but when you tell English people who wrote it, they're all shocked. Who wrote it was Henry VIII, King Henry VIII, in 1540. Uh, he wrote it because he wanted, there was a woman at court called Anne Boleyn. He was married to Catherine of Aragon and he wanted this other woman called Anne Boleyn. And she always wore a dress with green sleeves on. So he wrote this song called Green Sleeves for her. Most people know the words of song, nobody thinks about it. But nobody knew it was written 500 years ago. The, um, and 500 years ago it was written, and it's still uh, on every ice cream truck in the country. So it's gone viral over 500 years, yeah? Where the fuck was Facebook? Where the fuck was YouTube? When Henry VIII wrote that, if that's all you, what you need to go viral. This isn't the stuff that's going to make you go viral. What makes you go viral is a good song, a good idea, something people keep repeating. Henry VIII wrote that before there was electricity. And yet people have sung it and whistled it to other people, who've sung it and whistled it to other people, so it's gone viral. Now, if you have to have digital to go viral, how come stuff still exists for, that was done before the internet? How come Shakespeare still exists? How come paint, painting, how come Picasso still exists? if you have to have this to go viral. Because you don't have to have this to go viral. It doesn't go viral here. It goes viral here. This is technicians. This is not to do with what we do. The human brain is to do with what we do. Once we understand that our job is the human brain, Bill Birnbach said, our proper area of study is simple, timeless human truths. Now that will always be true. Simple, timeless human truths. Because at the end of what we do 
is always a human being and that simple timeless human truth. And it doesn't matter whether we get to them with an oil painting, a photograph, an email, a telephone call, or a piece of digital. If you know anything about behavioural economics, it's been described as human understanding for business advantage. Human understanding for business advantage. So if we're going to do that, we need to have some human understanding. We need to know how the mind works. How does communication work? Really, really simply. Because there's power in simplicity and weakness in complexity. So, really simply, how does every communication work, given that we're in the communication business? Well, like everything, it's a funnel. <clears throat> and there's two critically important bits in that funnel. It must work this way. And you must have impact. And you must have communication. And you must have persuasion. Those are your three elements. And it must happen that way round. Start here, all the way down there. If you haven't got any impact, well, nobody knows you're there, nothing happens. You have to have impact for the mind to even notice you. If you've got impact, but you've got no communication, well then, the mind doesn't know what you want. It's just like a loud noise. So, if you've got impact and communication, but no persuasion, well then the mind doesn't know why it should do what you want it to do. That's just someone shouting at you. And you know what they're shouting, but you don't know why you should do what they want to do. This is how everything in your life works, every day. It's so simple, we overlook it. We get so complicated with focus groups and insights and heuristics and algorithms and behavioural economics and all the other books we're reading, we forget this. This is absolutely everything normal in your life, every day. 20 times a day, this is what will happen in your life. In everybody's life. You, you imagine if... Um, Supposing it's a Wednesday night and I'm sitting at home watching football on the TV. Wednesday night I'm sitting at home watching football on the TV. And I want a cup of tea. But I don't want to get up and make it in case I miss a guy. But the wife is sitting there, she could make me a cup of tea. She's not watching football. But how does she know I want a cup of tea? First off, I've got to get on her radar. I've got to get her attention, I've got to get some impact. So I shout, Kath, Kath, Kath. And in the end she says, what? I've got impact. <laughs> she knows I'm there. But she doesn't know what I want. Now the way most advertising works nowadays, I would say to her, smooth, warm, sunny. Nice family feelings. <laughs> but because I actually want something and I'm not trying to win an award at Cairns, I'll say, make us a cup of tea. So we've got impact, we've got communication. But she says she doesn't know why she should do it. You know, well, why don't you do it yourself? <laughs> So I've got to think, and this is the clincher for all advertising, you've always got to think, well, what's in it for them? If anybody asks you to do something, you always think, well, what's in it for me? It's all right, that's, that's the way people, that's the way you deal. The way people deal with each other. So I'll say, I might say to her, well, Wednesday night, I know the garbage man comes around tomorrow. That means we've got to put the garbage out tonight for him to pick up. Uh, she doesn't like doing that. 
So I'll say to her, uh, okay, well, if you make us a cup of tea now, when the football's over, I'll put the garbage out. Now, if she thinks that's a good deal, I've got a sale. <laughs> Impact, she knows the communication, she knows what I want. Persuasion, she knows why she should do it. Can you think of any reason why we wouldn't want all of our ads to work like that? Impact, communication, persuasion. Are we ever not going to want an ad to have communication and persuasion? Are we ever not going to want an ad to have impact? <coughs> and yet, you don't have that on a brief. That's way too simple for all the sophisticated departments to put on a brief, which is why 89% of advertising isn't noticed or remembered. Because they can't do the simple things. Now, who does the simple things? Well, pretty obviously when you're doing an ad, impact is the job of the creative department. That's what art directors do. And copywriters. But the creative department, if you don't make them, it's like a football team. You've got to look at who does defence, who does midfield, who does, who does attack. If we're not scoring enough goals, I don't fire the goalie, I fire the forwards. And if we're letting in too many goals, I don't fire the forwards, I fire the goalie. So I've got to know how my team's working. If this is my agency, this is what my agency is supposed to be doing. This is the creative. If our ads have no impact, I don't fire the planners, I fire the creatives. Now if our ads have impact, but no one understands them, I might fire the planners and the, and the copywriters. If our ads have impact and communication, but they're not persuasive, nobody's buying anything, then I fire the marketing department. I don't fire the creative department, I fire the marketing department. But it's this way round, this is these people's jobs. What you've got at the moment, the problem is, these people think this is their job, so they'll interfere. The marketing department will interfere up here. Instead of doing their own job down here, they're interfering by telling us how to write ads and what should be in the ads, and that's not their job. That's like all the defence and the goalkeeper running forward to try and score goals. No, do your own job. If I can't do my job, fire me and get someone else, but you do your job. I don't run down and tell you how to write a marketing brief. That's your job. And if you can't do it, you get fired. We break it down by, if the ads aren't working, whose job isn't working, who should be doing it, who do we need to replace? It's a team. We don't have everybody doing every job. So marketing, you can have an opinion here by all means. But this is creative. Everybody can have an opinion here, I'm sure. That's what, that's what you do research for. Not to give you a brief, research is to find out if you're communicating. So, although this seems dead simple, and like all the best things, it is dead simple, but like all the best things, if you want to delve into this, this can get much more complicated. If you want to have a, uh, a hierarchy of communications, then this would be um, uh, broadcast, this would be narrowcast, this would be broadcast. So this would be TV, posters, uh, just general consumer media, and you work your way down here to online. This would be, this would be online. But you don't do impact online, and then do persuasion in the most expensive media there is. When you know this is what you're after, this is your end point, you can work out how all your different things build to it. Like anything, you start off with a, this is, strategy is what we do, tactics is how we do it. So strategically, this is what we're doing. Now tactically, you can look at either how you set your agency up like that, or you can look at how you set up your hierarchy of markovs, marketing communications like that. But either way, that's your end point, that's what you're doing. And what we know currently is 
89% isn't noticed or remembered. So 89% is failing here. And because it's failing here, you never get down to there. You never get past the rest of it because it isn't it when I've got impact. 89% fails there. So that's because we're not clear. Advertising isn't marketing. Marketing is marketing. Advertising is the voice of marketing. Marketing can be doing a great job on persuasion. But if nobody sees your ads, we never get to that. The job of, of the creative department isn't to sell stuff. The job of the creative department is to get what marketing has done to stand out. The job of marketing is to sell stuff. So, when we look at that, and we look at our particular problem, in the creative department, your particular problem is impact. Bill Birnbach said, uh, well, the most, he didn't say this, but the most important sentence on the brief <coughs> is never written on the brief. What's the most important sentence on the brief that's never written on the brief? I've never seen it, all the time I've been in advertising. The most important sentence on the brief, and it's never written on the brief. People must notice this advertising. You've never seen it on a brief because everyone takes it for granted. You take it for granted and yet 89% isn't noticed or remembered. In the UK, 17 billion quid pissed away because nobody, nobody tries to make the advertising noticed or remembered. Nobody realises that's the most important part and without that, nothing happens. So, what Bill Birnbach said, he, he said it better, he said if no one notices your advertising, everything else is academic. So, so we know that impact is the most crucial thing. So, for the creative department that is, impact is the most crucial thing. So, how does, how does impact work? Well, It's what they call semiotics, what the brain works on. It, the, brain's, the brain's software is called Gestalt. You should read up on that. That's the software that your brain is programmed on. All brains are programmed on. The, uh, 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 what we actually, you don't need to know this, well, it's good if you do. Uh, that's what we're actually looking to control. Now, we can make it as complicated as you like, and people do PhDs in it. Or, we can do it from a bus driver's and a truck driver's angle, which is keep it simple. Now, what Gestalt is from a bus driver's and a truck driver's angle, is, here's a commercial break. First commercial, second commercial, third commercial, fourth commercial, fifth commercial, sixth commercial, seventh commercial. The break's over and we go to bed. And next day we get up and go to the supermarket. Which one of those commercials are we most likely to be able to remember the next day? Which of the circles? The first, the second, the third, the fifth, the sixth or the seventh? Which of the circles are we most likely to remember? See, when you think like a bus driver or a truck driver, it's simple. You know what you'll remember. It isn't any of the circles. It's the one that isn't like the rest. It's the cross. That's gestalt. That's how the mind works. Your mind automatically groups things. The only way your mind can handle the plethora of information coming at it is by grouping everything into twos. Like binary, like a computer works. You 
work really fast because you group things into twos. So you group things into twos. A load of zeros and an x. This lot of stuff and that. The, that's how the mind works. They call it semiotics nowadays, but that's just a way to make it complicated so you can charge clients a lot of money for it. It's actually what, everyone, what babies learn this in their crib. If you've got any children yourself, you, you watch them. When they're born, they don't even know they're a person. They're just awareness looking at everything. When they're born, they don't even know they're a person separate to everything else. They're just aware. Now, gradually, over the first few months, you watch what the baby does. It sticks everything in its mouth. It's, it, it's fingers, it's, it's toes, the side of the crib, the blanket, the little toys. Gradually, its mind is programming itself that, wait a minute, when I do that it hurts, but if I bite that it doesn't hurt. But if I bite that it hurts, but if I bite this it doesn't hurt. So that means there's something that's me that's separate to that. So the baby groups everything into two things. There's a me, and there's not me. And that's the first experience of gestalt. It's his first experience of binary. When you're born, you're in what he, in, 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 when you're born, when you're in what Freud calls it, which is everything, and then you move into what Freud calls ego, which just means I am, which is me separate from everything. And that's done by gestalt by your mind programming is, isn't, is, isn't, is, isn't. And later on now, your mind will program really fast, up, down, left, right, in, out, black, white, hot, cold, everything like that, really fast. Like a computer, if you keep it to two simple things, you can go really fast. That's the stall. So, what use is that to us? Well, What, you'll find the conversations you will be having all the time in advertising agencies, you won't be having conversations like that, you'll be having conversations, um, which of these commercials did we prefer? Did we like this one, which was very similar to one that won at Cairns Light last year, or did we like this one, which has got a great soundtrack, or did we like this one, which was shot by Ridley Scott, or did we like this one, which was done by a very trendy Swedish company. What you will never talk about is this one, because that's scary. Nobody wants to do that. Everybody wants to do one that's slightly, very similar to everybody else's, where it's safety, but don't be too different, because you'll stand out. Yeah? Don't be too different. So what happens is you're not different. What happens is you're part of the 89% that isn't noticed or remembered. Because you never talk about, not just you, 89% of people don't talk about what's not noticed or remembered. You don't want to stand out. It's embarrassing standing out. And people might poke fun of you, at you. People might not like it. It's quite scary. So don't talk about that. Talk about this. Let's do a slightly nicer one of these. That one we saw last year in DNAD was nice. Let's copy that. That one we saw in um, American Art Director's Annual was nice. Let's copy that. Yeah? So that's why nobody does that. You have to be brave to be there. But as Steve Jobs said, why would you want to join the Navy when you could be a pirate? That's where the pirates are. This is the Navy. Now, much safer in the Navy. Much more reassuring and comfortable to be in the Navy. But this is where the pirates are. And a bit more scary to be a pirate. You're on your own if you're a pirate. So a lot of people calling themselves creative who are actually in the Navy. <laughs> but this is where the real creative is. They're pirates. They're on their own and it's scary. And they like that. 
And if you like to be on your own, and if you like to not care what other people think about you, and if you don't give a damn when other people don't like it, then you can be a pirate. You can be creative. But if you want everybody else to like you, your teachers, your mum and dad, or everybody else, all the account men, all the planners, all the other creatives, then I'm afraid you've got to be in the Navy. You, you might be a stylist, but you won't be a creative. Edward de Bono said, there are a lot of people calling themselves creative who are mere stylists. You can do, <clears throat> my art school was in New York and it was a Bauhaus art school. Uh, guys that had left Germany before the war uh, and uh, Bauhaus guys and started this art school in New York. And so the motto all the way through was form follows function. Form follows function. <coughs> the opposite follows is the important word. Form follows function. So function is the critical bit. You've got to get the function right. What a lot of people do nowadays who think they are creative is like they design beautiful chairs that you can't sit on because they're uncomfortable. Well, if you can't sit on it, it's not a fucking chair. An orange box is more of a chair because you can at least sit on it. The first job is do something you can sit on. Then when you've got that bit done, now we can make it look a bit better but form follows function. So, this is where form follows function lives, and this is where function follows form lives. These are the people who are, who are doing their work for other people in advertising, and these are the people that are doing their work for the rest of the billion people out there in the world. These are the people whose work will get into the language, go viral. Now, what use is that to us, though? See, here's how it works for us. You know, if you're doing advertising, here's the human brain, and here's 19 identical commercials. Nineteen identical commercials, right? Now, if I had one more, I'm one out of twenty, and they're all identical, what share of your mind have I got? One out of twenty expressed as a percentage is what? Five percent. You're very shy. <laughs> you're not going to be creative if you're that shy. 5%. But what we now know about gestalt, and we now know that the mind groups things into two lots. If I put in something that isn't like anything like any of the others, what your mind does is group it into one lot of things that are like that, all the same, all identical, and one lot of things that aren't identical. Now what share of your mind have I got? 50%. By doing nothing but being different. You see the power of just standing out. When we're looking for impact, that's how you get impact. Now, of course it's got to be good and it's got to be right, and you can't do anything silly or stupid like it. <clears throat> if we're selling a, a cake, we can't have a photograph of a turd because that would be stupid. But you get the idea that we have to do something to stand out and different. And that's how we go from 5% to 50%. <coughs> then, we own the, then we own the context we sort out what our competitive set is and we say what, what our positioning is that separates us off from that competitive set. There's a really good book written about 20 years ago called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind by Reese and Trout. 
It's the best thing I've read on the subject. You really should read that. Really simple. It's about the only book I recommend to creatives. Because it's dead simple. What it says is, you haven't really positioned yourself unless you've repositioned the competition. So if you've just got a strap line that says, together we can find the answers, you haven't repositioned anybody else, because you could write that for anybody. If you've got a strap line that feels comfortable and it doesn't reposition the competition, If you look at what Volkswagen did, what they said was we are when they when they launched all that time ago in America, everybody wanted big cars. Volkswagen launched and said, we're not big, we're tiny, we're small, we're ugly. They said they were everything the other cars weren't. And consequently they killed Detroit. Now Volkswagen's the biggest car company in the world. Avis was only a little tiny rent the car firm. And instead of pretending to be as big as everybody else, they said we're only number two. Now truthfully, they weren't even number two. But they said we're only number two, so we have to try harder than number one. You should look at all this stuff. This is history. This is, this is where great stuff came from. So consequently, they repositioned Hertz, and now Avis really are joint number one with Hertz. The Nike, you look at what Nike did, you look at what Apple did, you look at what all of the really successful guys did. They didn't pretend to be the same as everybody else. They absolutely made themselves different to everybody else. They didn't pretend to be the same, yeah? Now, the last thing I'll tell you, just as an illustration of that, is uh, that I think you all probably know and it's not advertising, but that's how the mind works, is, <clears throat> are there any Americans here? Okay, because you can't answer this question. <clears throat> but for the rest of you, don't shout out the answer if you know it, but hold your hand up if you know who was the 44th president of America. Hold your hand up if you know the name of the 44th president of America. Nobody? One? Well, can your hand up? Go on, don't be shy. One, two. Two. Okay, only two. Three. Okay, you're very shy. Um, okay, this time, don't be shy. Hold your hand up if you know the name of the first black president of America. Right. It's the same person. Barack Obama was the 44th president of America. But you see, one way I asked the question, who was the 44th president of America, making him just like all the others. Then I asked the one thing that makes him absolutely different from everybody else, who was the first black president of America, and suddenly it goes like that. Yeah? Because suddenly he's got half of your brain to himself. He's not like anybody else. When he's the 44th president, he's like everybody else from Abraham Lincoln to John Kennedy to Nixon to Clinton. But when he's the first black president, he's got... Now, when you look at that in what we do in advertising terms, you look at that with what Apple did, you look at that with what Nike did, as I said, with Avis, with uh, uh, Volkswagen, you'll have your own examples. The very, very, very best that's exactly what they do. And getting it down to that is the really difficult bit. And then simplify it and simplify it and simplify it. And if Barack Obama had just pretended to be like everybody else, he wouldn't be president. What made him president was he very loudly said, it's the first time a black man will be president. And that's what everybody voted for. So what you've got to do is that kind of thing. Get it down and down and down and down. And David Ogilvy said, strategy is sacrifice. 
start, that film I showed you at the beginning, it's not about adding more, it's about taking away and taking away and taking away <coughs> until you think you can't take any more away and then take more away. And when you take so much away, it looks blindingly stupid and obvious, that's the right thing to do. Because then you're talking to real people, not just to other advertising people. Yep, hope you don't. Thanks. Estávamos de aproveitar a presença do Dave para ter uma pequena sessão de perguntas e respostas. Vamos fazer alguns microfones passar pelo público. Quem quiser uh, perguntar alguma coisa, é o momento agora. Basta levantar o braço e nós levamos o microfone. Alguma pergunta? Há ah, uma pergunta. Sorry. I didn't get the, the name of the book that you that, that you said. <laughs> That's the authors, and the book is called. That's the only book I recommend to creatives. Everything else is way too complicated and way too involved. That's absolutely what we need to know. Uh, uh, recent trout and positioning. And very simple, very easy to read. You'll read it in the weekend. Thank and you very much. I want to pregunta aqui. Microphone aqui. I would like to ask your advice um, on that part, how to overcome the scary part of standing out, of not being afraid of yeah. making uh, yeah. full of yourself. No, sure, sure, sure. The, that, of course, is the biggest, that's the, best, that's the best and most important question, not just for advertising, but for life. And I'm English, so I know that. <laughs> the, uh, John Cleese once said, the goal of every Englishman is to get to his grave unembarrassed. The, uh, uh, what happened to me, I was really lucky. When I was 19, I went to America and I went to art school in New York and I saw how they were. And I thought, this is much, much better than the way I was. The way I was brought up was to be scared. And the way I was brought up was to worry what other people thought about me. And what in New York, they're not. He's worried about how other people think about them. And that's why they were effective. And I learned all the English people were actually really admiring of New Yorkers and the great advertising was being done in New York. <clears throat> and what New, why New Yorkers were great is because they didn't care what other people thought about them. What will stop you is what's in your own head. Your biggest enemy isn't out there. Your biggest enemy is in here. Now, the truth is, Someone was once asking me, what would I have written to myself at 21, if I could advise myself now at 21. At 21, you're really worried what other people are thinking about you. The real news is worse than that. Nobody's thinking about you. <laughs> Nobody gives a damn. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody could care less. You're not even alive. Everybody's got their own problems and their own worries and their own world, and everybody else is scared stiff, worrying what other people think about them. Yeah? You know, first time I used to do talks, I used to get scared stiff coming up here, thinking, oh, what do you do with all those people? And what I realise is, the people in the audience are more scared than I am. <laughs> Each of them is scared stiff of being picked on. Look at you all. I said, put your hand up. You're <laughs> you know, you're, you're, everybody's scared stiff. If, you're, if you can even make yourself a little bit less scared, you're better than everybody else, because everybody's frightened to death of what other people think about them. So how do you get over worrying about what other people think about you? Is It's like giving up smoking. Just do it, and gradually it gets easier. 
just stop worrying about what other people think about because mainly they're not thinking about you they're so scared about what you're thinking about them and what everybody else is thinking about them and anyway other people's problem is their problem they don't they worry about what they're thinking they i won't be here's what i learned about europe versus uh, uh, uh america the great thing about <clears throat> the bad thing about being english is you're brought up very repressed and you're brought up not to offend anybody not to worry about anybody just uh, 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 don't offend anybody and worry about other people's feelings and all that sort of thing, yeah? In America, you're brought, you, you, you brought up to, well, hey, don't worry about anybody, man, just do what you want to do, just do whatever you want. And I thought, so, I thought, well, you put the two things together. You will, you are European, so you will be respectful of other people's feelings, but if you can put the American side to that, which is you're still going to do what you want to do, you've got the best of both. Instead of having your whole life be worried and repressed, because by the time you're on your deathbed, and all you can say is, I never offended anyone. <laughs> yeah? Think of it, when you're on your deathbed, 60 years from now, it'd be too late to go back and do it again. You won't get the chance to go back and do it again. The guy I work with, my art director, he said to me what he wants on his gravestone is it's better to regret what you have done than what you haven't. You know, at least when it's all over now, you don't get a chance to go and do those things. It's better to... It, re regret is better than... Uh, 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 embarrassment is better than regret. You know, get embarrassed. First time you do it, you'll be embarrassed a few times. Okay, you get over that. And then you'll learn not to worry about it. And... You'll do a lot more. And sometimes, out of ten times, Three times you'll be embarrassed, and seven times it'll be great. Okay, instead of ten times you weren't embarrassed, and ten times it wasn't great. Bill Birnbach said, if you stand for something, you'll find some people for you and some people against you. If you stand for nothing, you'll find nobody for you and nobody against you. So you can live your life by being invisible. And when you die and you're on your deathbed, congratulations, you were invisible. Or you can live your life by being visible, and some people won't like it, and some people will. But you were visible. So it's your choice. How do you want to live your life? Do you want to, you know, nobody dislikes you. Nobody likes you, but nobody dislikes you. You were invisible. Or when it's time to die, some people didn't like you, but some people liked you, and you really were visible. There's a, there's a, a Spanish guy, I think, who said, uh, you ask me why I came to live, I tell you I came to live out loud. So that, how to get over that fear, it's like giving up cigarettes, just do it. And gradually it gets easier. At first it's hard, at first you're embarrassed, you stick your hand up in front of everybody and you're worried about what they think about me, sticking my fuck on. <laughs> They're not thinking about you, that's only in your own head. The people you think are worrying about you are all in here. It's, it's out there, they're not worried about you. They don't care. But in here you think they care. So the real thing is just to learn that it's all in your head. And the more you do it, the more you learn that. <laughs> <laughs> How we can tell that to the client? <laughs> well, no, you can't, clients, clients is a difficult one. That's why for me, the most important thing, when you're starting your own agency, the most, it's like I said, it's like a team. And the most important thing for me is a great accountant. I don't deal with clients. Clients don't like me. The, uh, I'm, they don't like the way I speak, they don't like I'm too outspoken, I say the wrong thing. They don't buy my ads. Now I get a really good account man whose job is to deal with clients, he can sell my ads. So if I try to make my ads run, it doesn't work. But I get a really good account man and he, he makes my ads run and it works. So I say, how, you, how do you deal with clients is you get a great account man. And the best account man, uh, it's just like a football team, isn't it? One guy kicks the ball out of defence, the other guy kicks it in the goal. No one does it all on their own. You put the team together. So, one guy for new business, 
One guy for dealing with clients, one guy for writing the ads, one guy, you know, like that. One art director, one copywriter, you, you put a team together. When I would put a creative department together, one guy who could do mass market, one guy who could do uh, upmarket products. Uh, just whatever. You're, always, you're always thinking of putting a team together. Yeah? So, with clients, you need a guy who, his job is absolutely loving dealing with clients. And he, client, he will make clients eat out of his hands so they will buy anything from him. That's the guy I'll give my ads to and he can go and sell them. Hi. Um, let me briefly uh, regarding the um, the pyramid that you just showed us the impact communication and persuasion. What would be your best advice for someone who wants to pass the environmental um, message in order to change some uh, people's habits? which we find it very, very difficult uh, nowadays. Even though people know it's happening and they know they want to make the change, they, they don't. So what will be your best advice? I, I, I can't say that without um, knowing the exact circumstances. Uh, as Bill Burnback said, principles endure, formulas don't. You can't have a formula. But <clears throat> you always look for the, for the weak point, for the pressure point. Advertising Here's the uh, factory where they make the product and here's the consumer who buys the product. Yeah? Now stupid people think this is what advertising does. Picks up a product at the factory and puts it it doesn't do that. There's a million different processes in the way there. There's pricing, distribution, whether they like it, whether it fits, how to get it. What you do is you find where on that line can advertising effect. What's the one part that advertising can effect? You, you'll do that. That's the real creativity in business, in military, in sport, in anything. What's the one area that I can affect. I haven't got enough money to do all of this. What's the one area that I can affect? Now, the... So what I tell you is, uh, you have to be bold, you have to be daring, you have to be different. The, um, uh, you may not be doing advertising at all. It depends how much money you've got. When, when we wanted to, uh, third world debt was a big issue. Five million children were dying every year as a result of the third world debt, which was Western commercial banks uh, insisting on getting, um, what do you call, uh, investment, um, interest payments from all the third world countries. They'd lent massive amounts of money to third world countries. Third world countries couldn't pay it back, so they had to take the interest on that from all their um, education, from their health and welfare, from food, from everything. So children are dying, five million a year. <coughs> so I was working on that, and we were doing loads of free, uh, uh, getting loads of free commercials made that we ran in cinemas, free posters, free press ads, everywhere about the third world debt. The bank should cancel the third world debt. And um, we couldn't, um, and we must have made billions of pounds for these ads. And they were okay, they were getting talked about. But then one day we thought, um, what's, um, where we really need to get this message is inside the banks. But you can't run advertising inside the banks. And we haven't got any money anyway. This is all voluntary. But you can't run um, uh, uh, posters or press ads or TV or radio inside banks. We need the banks to feel bad and for their people to feel bad and for staff morale to feel bad inside the banks. So how do we get a message inside the banks? If we get it inside the banks, maybe they'll begin to do something. How do we get a message inside the banks? There's no media inside the banks. 
So we sat and we talked about it and we thought about it and we thought, well, wait a minute, there is one thing we could use as media inside the banks. What the banks deal in that we could use as media? Paper money. We can write on that. It's, now the good news is it's illegal to write on that. And if you write on it, it has to be taken out of circulation. And in order to take it out of circulation, they have to, they're not going to take money out of circulation lightly, so in order to take it out of circulation, they have to fill in four forms. And each goes to four different departments, and each of those departments has to fill in four forms with whatever was written on the money. So we would write on each, we'd get a stamping kit, a little stamping kit, and stamp on all of our money, uh, cancel the third, stop killing children, cancel the third world death on the money, and it goes into the bank, there's a big, nice big white space for it. Stamp it on there, it goes into the banks, and the banks have to take it out. Four times it gets repeated, and then each of those, four more times, that's 16, 20 times, each time we stamp it, the banks have to rewrite it 20 times, inside the bank. And I must have spent about a quarter of a million pounds like that, and the guy, the guys I know the same thing, and everyone we're telling about it, and then we wrote commercials telling people to do that with their money. So now the money can get into the banks. And now you find all the banks have gotten rid of the third world debt. And now, was it totally down to the money? I don't know, but it helped. But if you haven't got any money for advertising, you have to think of other things. Think of exactly what, where your problem is. Where's the pressure point? And with us, it's inside the banks. And how do you get there when you can't get there, when there's no media? You have to think of a, a new creative way, yeah? Good morning, sir. Hi. It's a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> and uh, my question is, uh, John Haggerty said that the best strives because it's the best, not because it's the nicest. My question to you is, it, it's possible some, uh, to, a, to a person to be both, to become the best by being the nicest. I think you have to work that out for yourself. You have to work out where your strength is and do that. The important thing, sometimes, I mean, nicest doesn't, doesn't really interest me, so I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in that. So, uh, uh, I get my fun beating other people, not by being nice to other people. John, in truth, I know John very well, he also gets his fun beating other people, and he pretends to be nice. <laughs> but I like John a lot, he's a really good guy. The, the, uh, uh, but why is nice important? Nice shouldn't be important, nice doesn't matter. You, nice would be you do a job, and what is the job? And if the, you know, what, if your job is uh, stopping people smoking, why are you worried about being nice? Your job is stopping people smoking. If your job is uh, selling, selling cars, why are you worried about being nice? Your job is selling cars. If you want to be nice, then maybe you should be a nurse. Maybe this is the wrong job. Form follows function, yeah? And the function isn't to be nice. That might be the form you end up with, depending on the job. But our function isn't to be nice. Our function is our, our function is to beat all other advertising, be part of the four percent that's remembered, not the eighty-nine percent that isn't noticed or remembered. If, you know, nice. Then for me personally, it isn't interesting. If you want to be nice, then. I don't know, maybe you would go and work for charity or something. Or, 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 if nice is important. Nice has never, in my life, it never featured being nice. So nice is kind of boring. The, the uh, fun is interesting. Fun and exciting and lively and, and that. So, uh, at art school, where, where my art school, nice was another way of saying me. If you didn't really like something much, you'd say, yeah, it's nice. <laughs> you know, it's pretty, it's chocolate boxy. Nice. But, you know, 
Well, they say nice guys finish last. If you're worried about being nice, then really you shouldn't be in a competitive situation. Because competition is not about being nice. Nice is about being nice, not really being nice, but it's a different thing. Yeah? For me.